Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Hi, my name is Vivian Aqua and I'm the Inclusive Workplace Wellness Advocate. And this is the first episode of 2021, Let's Humanize the Workplace. And I'm super excited about 2021. And yes, I'm done. I'm done with this lockdown. Here in the Netherlands, we are in a super tight lockdown, as in my son is being homeschooled by his parents. And I am... Every day I am ending my day with a prayer and starting my day with a prayer, but it is a whole lot. So remember the episode that I did about working moms? I am just being inspired by these conversations of the working mother. So uh, if you're a mother, if you are, it, no, let me, let me rephrase it. If you are a working parent with kid homeschooling your kids, this prayer is for you. I know what you're going through and I wish you a lot of, you know, a lot of miracle, a lot of magic and wusa at the end of your day. So I feel you. But I also have something to share. And that is, there is this buzz going on uh, about the clubhouse. So I had to bring 50 Cent. You know, people who know me, I always think in music and when somebody invited me, Mariana invited me for the clubhouse. Clubhouse is like a secret society where you can only have, you know, uh, various conversations or be inspired by your role models, but also uh, become an inspiration yourself. And I would say, um, unfortunately, the clubhouse app is only available on Apple, which is unfortunate and which is not inclusive yet. But if you have an Apple iPhone, Please install this, uh, install this app and reserve your, your name because I will be hosting impromptu sessions in the clubhouse. So you can find me at Viva La Vive NL and uh, look for this app with a picture in the, with somebody in the picture. They sometimes switch, but this is the current picture at the moment. And like I said, you can find me in the club. But before, before um, I want to introduce today's session because there is so much buzz about this episode. So the reason why I started this episode, because I wish when I started out my career, I wish there was a separate handbook or separate guideline or separate podcast or whatever to guide me through a way for me as a person of color, as a woman of color, for me to amplify my career. And as this is the new year, new beginnings, new new things, new ambitions, new ways for you to amplify your career, I had to bring on the heat. So I'm, in, I'm, I'm inviting all the ladies and bear with me because I'm going to bring them all up and going to introduce them as well. So let me see their bio. First one is Gurpreet. Gurpreet helps SMBs with attracting and retaining right talent to grow their business. Liz Leiba is the podcast host of the Ed Up Experience LinkedIn Top Voices 2020. And I know her as the social justice warrior and definitely an advocate in every way. Simone Bo. Um, create strategies, the transform talent and the culture in progressive organizations while helping global leaders amplify their personal brands. And I see the comments coming in. People, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Naomi, Naomi Williams is a career advisor who connects top talents who are working on creating a bright future. Melanie Jacob is a diversity and inclusion consultant supporting companies who are interested in being part of an inclusive world. And again, my name is Vivian Aqua and I'm the inclusive workplace wellness advocate. As you can see, I love talking, but I love talking to create a better world, a better work environment. So ladies, thank you for joining. And if you would see the comments that I have here on, I already have 20 comments, so I need to highlight them. Hi, Michael, thank you for, for sharing this. Uh, Michael is always bringing fire into into all the conversation. I think I assume that most of the ladies know him. And if you don't, please connect with Michael because he's a true social justice warrior. Then you have Toki, 
Uh, thank you, Toki. Thank you, Julie Turney. Julie is Barbados. And Julie, I have to warn you, Melanie already told me that I need to go to St. Lucia because they apparently have better mangoes. Again, this is not, you know, this is not the, the platform to fight about the mangoes, but I'm just dropping it there. There will be some mangoes going on. <laughs> Thank you, Daniela, who is amazing. And I met Melanie through Daniela as well. So thank you, Daniela, for sharing this. And Reginald is also there. Amazing, amazing. Deborah, thank you. Wow. They keep on coming. Oh, bring the heat. Melanie. Melanie, do you see that? Okay. Kobe, Kobe, <laughs> Naomi's champion. Yay. <laughs> Hi, Simone and Evelyn Porter. So ladies, okay, I'm done with the comments. Let, let's start with the with the insights where I want to where, where I want to bring you. So first, Gurpreet, thank you for being here. I have ladies from St. Lucia, I have Canada in the house, I have Spain in the house, I have Barbados in the house, and I have US in the house and myself from the Netherlands. So this is an international setting. And I want to start with Gurpreet. Um, why do we need to humanize the virtual workspace? Um, first of all, thank you, Vivian, for organizing this. And I get to meet all the other ladies who I've, I've never met. So thank <laughs> you for this opportunity. Um, why should we humanize? I think more than ever, if the pandemic hasn't shaken the workplaces up about why we need to humanize, then you know you can't really change anything if the pandemic hasn't shown it. We're human beings. I think in the pandemic, um, how many people are cracking down on juggling, being at home, kids, and work? Yeah. And how many people are overworking? We, we're seeing people as machines. We're actually just seeing them as people that people need to have that work-life balance. And I think the more you exhaust them out, they're no benefit for anybody. And I think the pandemic has really opened eyes for many people and also individually people have also woken up to, well, I can't work for an organization that doesn't see me as a human being. And I think that's why it's so important to treat every single person, <laughs> see everybody as a human being. That's my two cents for now. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And Melanie. I had to find the unmute button, sorry. No <laughs> Hello no everybody. Yeah, thank you so much Vivian for inviting me to this panel discussion. Mm -hmm and being able to speak to these gorgeous women from all over the world that's just amazing especially in 2021 and i think mm -hmm. that actually like comes to full circle like what we're talking about how to humanize the workplace and why it's important to do so is because we need to connect with people because like no longer are we able to have coffees at work or stop at the water cooler and talk to each other and have that human approach now we're all doing it virtually and sometimes we miss that little that little thing that makes us feel connected, that makes us feel like we're supposed to be, we're a part of a group that we're supposed to be here together. So especially with this pandemic, I think that we really need to focus on this and just connect more with people and just have this really like all encompassing approach, especially for people of color right now. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Naomi. Well, I could not agree more with, with uh, Melanie and with Gurpreet. It's the same for me, it's connecting, it's, it's why why do we need to humanize because we are human we need to reconnect with our humanity again and for me a big part of that is is empathy we need mm -hmm. a healthier way of competing with each other you know if competing is even needed or if it's even yeah. a word i would you know i would lo i love what melanie said connect instead of competing let's let's connect and we need we need workplace policies to be incorporated to be more yeah more gentle with each other it started with those open workspace, like, you know, let's break down the walls and then everybody can sort of see each other and we can collaborate better. But it's much more than just that. So for me, it's it's connecting and it's empathy. I have a guest, a little guest coming in. time, <laughs> And you also wanted to say something to the people. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. 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 Hello.
Another one. Bye. Bye. Christian. <laughs> he wanted to say something, so this is his moment. Yes. Um, the human connection. I was going to say a perfect example of exactly. why. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> if, was, if this was the corporate world and we weren't in the pandemic, someone would have looked at it and be like, how unprofessional. Yeah. Exactly. True. 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 Right. <laughs> Simone. Yes. Hello, everyone. And thank you again, Vivian, for this opportunity. I agree with what everyone has said so far. And I, I exactly was on the same page because I go through that as well with getting those insertions into mm -hmm. my online meetings and things. And, and that is exactly why we have to humanize the workplace. We live real lives. And yeah. so, yes, people can say, oh, how unprofessional and all of this stuff. But this is a part of what everybody is dealing with right now. People are dealing with virtual school for their kids, just trying to manage their households, trying to manage their sanity um, in yeah. times like this, just trying to balance it all because everything now is happening at home for a lot of people, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and just the danger, the uncertainty, all of these things, I think it's, it's really important for us to, to use the empathy as, as Naomi said, and I believe that we have to focus also on a lot of the issues that we're going to talk about today are pre-COVID issues. Mm -hmm. And COVID and the pandemic has only amplified a lot of the concerns and stressors and things that people have to deal with, work included, that we can't ignore. And we can't just pass it off as this is a COVID issue. These are just magnified because of COVID and we need to have strong strategies in place to, to deal with them appropriately now more than ever. Definitely. Definitely. I do see that when post COVID, I think that a lot of people are going to ask, uh, are going to hold the companies accountable. What did you do pre? Correct. What did you do yeah. during? Yes. And how are you following up post? Yes. Right. Absolutely. But I will hand the mic over to the Jedi herself, the social je justice Jedi. So Miss Miss 2020 LinkedIn voice, what do you have to say about this, Liz? <laughs> yeah, the, all the ladies really touched on everything that I think is so salient right now. The empathy, the fact that this is not just something that's happening in the U.S. So there's been very... Uh, huge in terms of history, because I'm always, I teach American literature and I'm always thinking about things from a historical uh, perspective since I am in the college classroom with my students. And we've had September 11th, we had um, Hurricane Katrina. There's been really huge issues that have happened in the United States that have been like, wow, this has been, has touched all of us, or this has been something that has brought the, the country to a, a grinding stop. But this mm -hmm. COVID is totally different. This is global in sphere and we're all going through the same thing. We all feel a sense of loss. We all feel a sense of fear. We all feel overwhelmed. Many of us are dealing with issues with our children and we're not afraid to say, hey, my child needs me for a second. I'll have to call you when I get done with that, or I have to fix lunch, or I have homeschooling going on right now. None of us are holding back. And I think for myself as a working mom, my son is six. And there was a time where you felt like, oh, let me not say that because I don't want people to think I'm not doing my job, or I don't want people to think I'm slacking off, or I don't want people to think I'm trying to get special treatment. I worked from home and I almost felt like afraid to go tell my boss, like, hey, you know, I want to be able to have a flexible work schedule. And I was revolutionary on my job doing that a few years ago because it was like, you can't do that. If you do that, then you, you, they might fire you. Like they mm -hmm. might try to find a way to get rid of you. Now we're all seeing that, Hey, there's work-life balance. There's women or men that are parenting and we have to be able to balance both. And I think here in the U S we have a cultural phenomenon of, Hey, you just have to work hard and put your nose to the grindstone and don't tell people that you're struggling in any way, whether it's health or whether it's parenting, because then they think you can't do your job. Now, we're in a global pandemic and we're all in the same mind frame of, well, I'm just trying to keep my head above water. So at this point, 
the job is going to have to understand. I'm not going to have to fit if they, they can't fire all of us, right? So it's not a matter of, oh, I have to now jump through hoops to make sure my job understands that I'm doing my, my job and that I'm worthy of being a part of the workplace. They have to be understanding of us because we're all going through the same thing. So mm-hmm. definitely we're going to hold them accountable after this. Yeah. And, and we're going to not necessarily, you know, just f- fall for this idea that we have to just work 80 hours a week and, and not have that work-life balance. We're not doing that after COVID. So things are going to change. <laughs> Things are changing. The fact that we are speaking up about this is already a fact to that chain. But going to the juicy stuff, because a lot of people are in here because of the main question, how can people of color amplify their career? Because in the beginning, I started, I I stated with, I wish I had known the tips that you are all sharing during this conversation. I wish I had known. So I want to share this to the next generation but I also want to address it to the current generation. So think about both people, think about, you know, all people of color, but definitely think about every person that you want to support with your answer. And if you could share one tip, what would that be, Liz? My tip would be to think about your brand. I never Mm -hmm. thought about my brand and who I was as a professional, which I'm, I, I, somebody posted, I think it was Madison that posted today about the idea of professionalism and what does that mean? And I'm, I'm always rapidly following a lot of these posts that some of the more vocal um, members of the LinkedIn community are posting because a lot of the things that they even talk about, it's like things I have in my head. I'm like, wow, why do we think a certain way? And I think when, it, when we think about branding, I would tell, and I used to always tell my students when I taught like um, professional writing, make a LinkedIn profile, make sure you put mm-hmm. your resume up, just make sure that you're able to network. But I didn't really think about it in terms of how important it is to think about your own personal mission. What do you stand for? What are you trying to say? What do you believe in? And I think this year, 2020, caused a lot of us to think like that. So that would be my tip. Think about in terms of not just putting yourself out there and putting a resume out there and, and networking, but being intentional with that. Like, what do you actually stand for? What is your goal? What is your mission? And find a way to create that, what that means and and be thoughtful in creating content that reflects who you are as a professional. And like I said, in that, in, t- in that term, I am conflicted with that term because for me, I think I'm starting to reimagine even what my role as a professional actually means, but determine what that is and make sure that you're intentional with creating that brand because your brand is your calling card. That's who you are. So that would be my main tip. Thank you. And going to Naomi. For me, I think it would be, it goes really in line with what Liz said. For me, it would be be visible. You know, promotion or or getting further in your careers is in healthy and fair environments. It goes by merit, but it doesn't go by merit. Let's you know, let's not, let's not completely fool ourselves. It doesn't go by merit only. So you need to be competent and visible, qualified and visible. Anything you want and visible. So mm-hmm. for me, that would be that would be the main tip. And and then people ask like, okay, but how do I do that? Like, you know, do I am I loud or or how am I visible? And and a couple of years ago, it wouldn't even occur to me as as you know, especially with the students that I that I support in in the, in the university that I work at work at. But for example, find a mentor. And and Vivian and yeah, we had a short <laughs> chat about it that I would love to pick up on on later. But um, find a mentor, find someone. And if you are a person of color, find a black or a brown mentor. That's even better because they can relate. And then we go back to empathize. They can empathize uh, and support you more actively on your way up. We, we women, black people don't, in my opinion, I only speak for myself, um, but I believe we do not do that enough. We do not normalize it. Maybe we see it as a weakness. Maybe we see it as I need to ask for help or I need to ask for a favor. But if you look around, men have been doing it for ever. White men have been doing it for to, ever. <laughs> to add on to your the maybes, maybe it's also something that you have never seen because my world changed 
ever since becoming an entrepreneur, opening new doors, opening new ways. And I'm thinking, oh, you know that moment where in coming to America, that person or the barbershop, they goes, uh-huh, after the uh-huh. show. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That's, what, that's what I get when I see something like, oh, is this how you do networking? Oh, is this that easy? So yes, I can say so much more, but I want to I want to address, I want to leave some space for the guests as well. So Simone, what do you have to add to that? Well, mine would be to know your value. And I think it's tied mm-hmm. to what Liz and Naomi said. I And I believe that when we talk about being people of color, that we almost have to defy cultural norms. Yeah. So I can speak from growing up in the Bahamas. And it is a sign of respect to, I was just talking with a girlfriend about this the other day, that we're taught children should be seen and not heard, right? Mm-hmm. We're taught that, right? And then on the flip side, it's almost schizophrenic, right? <laughs> the lessons that we're taught, because then on the flip side, we are taught qualify yourself, no holds barred, go out there, do everything you can to, to shine. Mm-hmm. But then we're also told to not say anything, to not speak up, to not shine, to it, be invisible. And so it really affects, I believe, how we see ourselves and how we see our value. And so when we don't acknowledge our value, we are more hesitant to to speak up in the way that we ought to, that we're afraid to have that ask, to ask for what we want, to say when our boundaries are being crossed. All of those things, I believe, is tied to knowing your value, knowing your worth, and being able to make the choices and decisions that we need to based on our value. Okay, I forgot the snap, the snapping, I forgot the, the awesome card, but just so you know, Naomi and Simone, definitely. This all right, is all right. <laughs> you got it, you got it, uh... Yes, we can snap here. This is an all people of color panel, so we can snap. <laughs> Girl creaked. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to go back to what uh, Liz Naomi said, as well as um, Simone. Um, that's the tip I had too: is personal branding. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of people underestimate the power of branding. Personal, I call it personal branding because a lot of times we get too caught up in being so professional that we lose ourselves. Right? We are we. We we as an individual are ourselves and that's what people connect to um and i started doing this mine's a little bit different story like i lost my dad to be able to have a voice and be myself true self not caring what anybody has to say about me and it's kind of like a blessing in disguise because that's when the magic started happening when people started connecting more and more and more with me um and opportunities started coming as an entrepreneur um and i i really really believe the true power in anybody that wants to make more money in their career business it is branding and then on top of that know which platform to use for me and all of us here but for me LinkedIn. I think it's yeah. a gold mine platform. So many people are underestimating the true power of this platform, but not utilizing it to its full potential, right? And then content writing. Yes, write content, speak your minds, have a voice in a respectful manner, be able to add value and make an impact in even if it's one person's life. Make an impact every single day. Too many people are so caught up in likes and comments, but forget the true value of a content writing is to make an impact. So if you're going to build your brand and write content, also remember that is it going to add value to somebody? And when you're adding value, going back to Simone's point, don't forget one other aspect is who, can you make someone money? Because I think a lot of times uh, as career professionals, I know definitely as an HR professional, I was never taught to show the money. I learned this as an entrepreneur. So to imagine me as an HR consultant trying to go sell myself, first, I don't know how to sell because I'm in HR. Second, I don't know anything about money because I'm not finance, right? So it took me a long time to learn these things. And then I was like, oh my God, I need to show money. Show money. This I'm not HR, I'm business, and this is how I can make you money or save you money because my function is cost saving. And I think 
two things you need to realize is show the money. Either you're saving money or you're making company money. The day you can crack that and keep your data. I think a lot of people don't keep stats. Keep your data. And every job, make sure you keep data, stats, and figures and numbers because that's what's going to get you the next high paying job. Okay, this is the Rihanna thing, like money and snapping all yeah, the Melanie same time. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Melanie. Are You're you muted. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so no I think worries. everybody brought up like really good points. But then one thing I really want to zero in on is like bringing your entire self to work. And I think that's mm -hmm. how we can amplify our careers because a lot of us don't feel comfortable doing so in the first place before we can even think about becoming an entrepreneur or continuing to work at where we are or even looking for a new job. We have no idea what we feel comfortable doing and if we can actually feel comfortable in the environment that has been created for us as well as the yeah. environment that we want to create for ourselves so i think you have to think of what are your okay that can what are your objectives what are you trying to offer mm -hmm. into this world and you have to go into your and you have to go into who you are culturally what you care about socially what you care about geographically, linguistically, and all these things add to your personal brand and they're able to help you amplify your career and find your niche. Because each of us has been able, thank God, to find our own niche in whatever we're doing and we're able to amplify it thanks to that. So I think when it comes to the personal branding, we have to really think about our cultural and social impact and everything we can do to, to amplify that. Especially on LinkedIn, I feel like what Gurpreet said is so important because I, at the beginning, thought that LinkedIn was just a space for white men <laughs> to find each other and to connect with each other. And it's until I started going into what I cared about culturally and racially that I was able to find my own community. So you really have to focus in on these aspects of your life. Definitely. And I also want to add in two things because um, you shared everything about personal, a lot about personal branding. You shared about authenticity. You shared so many about knowing yourself, knowing your values, but also if you don't have the, the means or have the budget to grab a coach, yeah. you know what? You have the library, you have access to Kindle or maybe go to a library and find out valuable books, even books from Stephen Covey, or I would also want to highlight, you know, uh, my fan favorite from a woman of color, that's Minda Hartz, uh, Kanika Tolver. Those two books are must have books, especially when you want to amplify your career because they share a lot of knowledgeable things from the woman of color perspective, which can be easily applied to uh, people of color in general, right? Um, I also want to want to share with you, I grew up in an age where I only had access to the library and only had access to sometimes to Oprah. That was my, you know, building up knowledge. Now you have access on your phone. You can Google stuff. You can, you can, like I said, you can borrow books. You can go to books, but no podcasts. What I shared in the beginning, right? Clubhouse is a new thing, a platform. Go to Instagram live if you see uh, a mentor, if you see somebody, an influencer who is who can positively influence you into amplifying your career. So find out the right people. Yes, um, Cecilia, um, I will type in the book titles in the next question. So I'll definitely drop the, the names and the book so that you can, uh, can look it up. But Kanika Tolver and Minda Hartz that's a must have in your library for people of color. That's, that's it. Um, going to the next question. What would you say to your younger self, Gurpreet? Learn how to sell. Um, I, I've been reflecting a lot since I became an entrepreneur. And when I learned how to sell, I was like, oh my God, this is what I should have learned when I started my career was learning to sell me but even at work learning to sell a lot of times we're never taught how to sell we're taught to have degrees we're taught to have uh resumes and cover letters but we're never taught to actually sell ourselves 
that adds value to our company. But furthermore, selling isn't just, hey, this is what I can do for you. But selling is also understanding pain points and knowing the solution and how you can solve that problem for someone. So when you are going to interviews or whatever, or if you want to grow your career, always be 10 steps ahead of the game by always knowing the current challenges and future challenges in your industry, in your profession. So you're 10 steps ahead to knowing how to solve the problem. So when you can solve anyone's problems, they're gonna want you. It doesn't even become about experience degrees or credentials or color of your skin anymore. Because if you, if a company's in a binding stock situation, but you can solve it, you're getting hired. So learn to sell in a way where you know the problem, you're the solution, and this is how you're gonna solve it, and this is why they would benefit from you by solving this problem for them. Again, it ties back to the money. Awesome. And Naomi, what would you say to your younger self? Um, sorry, I had a mute button on. I, I, would say, I would say to be more comfortable around failure. For me, but yeah, I would tell myself not to let failing at something or being wrong, you know, on occasion define me as they are all part, part of, you know, life. And then I think for me, there is this amazing video. I just shared it with a couple of, uh, well, in a couple of WhatsApp groups um, that just came out. Hey, Queen, and I'm not sure if any of you have seen it from uh, mm, Netflix, from right? Netflix. Michelle Obama. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And there is this actress, Debbie Allen, who says, relax, relate, release. And mm. for me, that just, that, that's what I would have told my younger self. I'm telling it, yeah. I'm telling it now. I'm telling it myself now, my younger inner self. <laughs> can we, can we um, address failures as lesson learned or lessons, life lessons? Because I don't believe in failures. Because the fact is that when you say something is a failure, that means that all these times that people are inventing ideas or creating something, that means that that was a failure. Sometimes a failure is your next step to level up Definitely. and to learn from. It's an opportunity to learn. To learn. From. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. move forward. Okay. For me, it is, it, you know, an opportunity to learn and move forward. Yes, definitely. Melanie. Yeah, I think like for me, I would have to say, don't pay attention to what other people think your future should look like. Because I was studying languages, Spanish and French at university and everybody was like, why don't you do law? Why don't you go into medicine? You won't um, be able to pay your bills or you won't be able to survive and you only mm -hmm. be able to teach. And now I'm able to travel as much as I can, communicate with different people of all different languages. And that's something that really helps me in working in diversity and inclusion, as well as in communications. It's something that I'm so proud of right now. And I just wish that I didn't make people influence me so much, even though I did stick to it, thanks to my family. But I wish I just did not pay heed to any of these comments. And I just continued with my life because who knows, I would have never been able to live in France or like mm -hmm. move to all True. these different countries and have an exciting life. <laughs> yeah. True. Simone. Yes, this was hard to just have one tip, but <laughs> I have to read it in one tip. <laughs> like, like little girl, you need to sit down and learn some things. But <laughs> my tip would be to speak up. Mm. And I know again, I keep going back to the norms and the things that we've been taught and conditioned with societally, culturally, as people of color. But when we're taught that silence is golden. Mm -hmm. When we're told, I mean, I've had bosses who would tell me, oh, you need to stand down. You know, I'll, I'll handle this, you know, this type of stuff where we're conditioned to feel like we can't know and use our voice, you know, and then this now becomes a part of our brand. This is now we become that person that just sits in our office, sits at the cubicle, sits in the board meeting and doesn't say anything. You know, I just let other people speak. And so I would definitely tell my younger self that when the opportunity arises, use your voice, mm -hmm. share your contribution, show your value. It's not about showing off, but it's about showing your worth. Thank you. And Liz? 
Yeah, I just reiterate everything the ladies have said. It's just so important and so empowering uh, talking about the idea of selling. Like my career started, for the most part, I started in sales, even though I am a trained writer I went to school for journalism, I ended up working in sales. And that's something that is really important because I tell my English composition students that all the time, anytime you're in the workplace, you're selling, you're selling something, yeah. you're selling an idea, you're, you're emailing your boss, even to say, I want to get a day off. You're selling, you're, you're, you're doing something to convince somebody of something. It could be a client, it could be a patient, it could be your coworkers, it could be your subordinates. You're always trying to sell your ideas, make a claim, support that claim. So we have to be comfortable with that idea that everything that we're doing really revolves around the idea of selling something to somebody and wanting to be sure that I think when I worked in sales, I was never really good at asking for the clothes. And that's really important to know when to say, okay, you know what? Let's, let's go ahead and get this paperwork together. Let's go ahead and, and make this thing happen. I think as women, sometimes we are tentative because like some of the ladies have said, we're taught to, I don't want to be too pushy. I don't want people to think that I'm being aggressive. So asking for the clothes, I think I was always a good rapport builder. And I think rapport building is important as well because as the ladies have stated, you want to be authentic. What are you bringing to the table and, and what's going to make people like you? Because one thing I always learned in sales, and this is why I was always good at building rapport, people can buy anything from anywhere, but mm -hmm. most of the time they buy stuff from people they like or people yeah. that they see something in that they're like, oh, I relate to that. So it goes back to the branding that we talked about initially in that you have to be authentic. I think when I was in sales, one thing I would always do is if it was a mom, I'd be like, I'm a mom too. And you know what? My teenager is driving me crazy. Let's talk about how we can figure this out mm -hmm. and, and put something together that's going to work for you. So doing that, not being afraid to, as the ladies have said, just be transparent. Just speak your truth. Stand on your belief. And I think sometimes we're taught not to do that because we feel so that's a weakness. But one thing I've learned from LinkedIn in the past year is that being authentic and being transparent and sometimes being vulnerable is something that people need that because people need to see, you know, there are other people that are out here that have struggled and overcome. And maybe that's mm -hmm. the value that you can bring that person. And maybe doing that can take that person from A to Z, and they didn't even know that they could get to P, let alone Z, but you showed them that mm -hmm. path. And they were like, you know what? If Liz did it, I can do it too. So that's yep. a lot of value in that idea of being able to bring your value and bring your truth. I love that. And one thing that I do want to add is never dim your light. I am very tall. I'm six foot something. I, I don't remember what the American uh, thing is, but I'm very tall. And um, I made myself small. So never dim your light. Never let anybody else dim your light because they don't understand you or they don't get you. I, my, my friends, sometimes they think that I'm born on planet Mars because of the way that I communicate and I'm a nerd. So I, I can talk a little bit nerdy, so they don't get me, but I don't mind. I, I found my click where they get me and I found a way to marinate the two, to amplify my light, to shine bright, like, uh, like a diamond, like Rihanna is sharing. But I wanted to um, address something because Reginald asked something and I'm shifting a little bit from our initial conversation, but I think also when somebody's asking something very important, I also want to address that as well. So Reginald, I haven't forgotten it, but I wanted to address this here. He is asking if you believe that you have been discriminated against in the workplace hiring process on the basis of ethnicity, yet you don't have concrete proof. Should you report the company or hiring manager? Personally, depending on what your end goal is, because that's also something that you have to be aware of, is what do you want to do? Do you want to address it and finding, you know, finding a foot between the door? Activate your calling in all the time. But if you want to activate your calling out card, know that you are burning your bridges directly from the get-go and it's also online please don't do that online because that's not the reputation that you want to to leave behind but I'm also curious about what the other ladies have to share uh, Naomi 
Yeah, I think it's a little bit, it's that it's the, you don't have concrete proof part that is sort mm -hmm. of tricky. Um, because it also, for me, it also depends. Um, a lot is how do I interpret something, you know, cultural yeah. aspects. Uh, so for me, it would be complicated to say like, okay, yeah, go report company or report a hiring manager. Um, I would definitely speak to someone about it. And if you could sort of get a feedback round, like, could you explain what has happened? For me, that would be a better, you know, a, a more appropriate approach. But mm -hmm. curious to hear what the other ladies are going to say about this. But yeah, I would definitely be, be a bit uh, cautious with, you know, what they say, pulling the race card. Yeah. Simone. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, you need to be cautious. I would say that if the company has maybe an anonymous way for you to report concerns, then I would go that route, perhaps. But to be very careful, especially when you don't have the proof, mm -hmm. and especially, as you said, to not go online ranting about it. I think that that's definitely shooting yourself in the foot. People are online, companies are online a whole lot more. And not only will that company look at what you're saying about them, but other companies will. And they will definitely put you in a negative light in your job search journey. And so I would tread with caution. And maybe if there is someone that you know that works in the company, if you know someone who perhaps you can whisper a word to and say, you know, I, I, I think this might have been the case. I'm not sure if you, that person is trustworthy enough, if you feel confident, you can do that. So finding legitimate ways to file a report and definitely avoid social media ranting. Okay, Reginald is sharing some context. Um, I think, Melanie, it sounds a little bit familiar. Um, I know someone who applied for a job as a French teacher in a French school in the United States, and she was told that her CV was perfect. But when she interviewed via Zoom, she was told, sorry, we are looking for somebody, someone who looks more French. She is a Black Canadian female. Yeah. How do you look French? <laughs> maybe, maybe you have to eat, uh, you have to to eat uh, bread or something, or wine. <laughs> drink, drink more wine. I don't know. Right, right, right. French bread. <laughs> I don't understand. Now, uh, it would have been interesting. Me, in the moment that would have been shocking, but uh, I would have. Boy, if, if that was like a recorded <laughs> session or something. <laughs> <laughs> but if you have a recorded session, it you have proof. That's the yeah. thing. For me, I think I would have I would have asked the question like, okay, exactly what you said, Vivian. Well, how exactly do you look French? Like, what kind of French profile are you exactly looking for? Exactly. But um, yeah, I would have. I would, I would just grab my wine and say, "Do you want me to drink more wine? Does that yeah. make me more French, or do you want me to dip it in, you know, some <laughs> butter, the bread in some butter? It, that I mean." Come on. That's, That's definitely something no, no. to look yeah. <laughs> yeah. no, no. Go, go Preet, do you have something to add? I would um, just both what both of the, the other ladies said, I'm going to echo the same thing. Um, you know, you may not prove, but is this a battle you're willing to fight? How important mm. is this to you? Because, second of, because the second point of this is no one's going to listen because it's hiring, right? How much can you really change someone? Um, if they, and this is like, I was blown away by like, clearly that person who's recruiting um, needs some training on how to recruit and what not to do. <laughs> so I think the company needs some training. Um, second of all, <laughs> you think it, they yeah, need it. <laughs> like, uh, you don't look French, you're clearly just <clears throat> on a spot. Um, but yeah, if you have proof, I would, take some measures, it depends on how important this is to you, right? Something like this happened to me um, and I have proof, I wouldn't, in Canada, we have laws, right? So I, I have proof I can take it. Um, but in the end of the day, you gotta look a little bit, take a step back and ask yourself, well, how is this gonna solve your problem? Because they're not gonna hire you anyways. And second of all, would they, are they gonna change? Very unlikely, right? Um, it's a battle that you're never gonna win but I also think that you've dodged dodge your bullet. Would you want to work for a company like that? 
like I don't like to me that's how I see things as someone can't pronounce my name but too bad I don't want you because growing up in Canada my name's Gurpri I've been told by so many recruiters to change my name so that you can get more calls and I was like heck no this is my identity this is my name you can't pronounce my name and you're not calling me because you can't pronounce my name I don't want to work for you but that's yeah. kind of the attitude you're going to have to develop uh, as a person of color or different ethnic backgrounds that you can't as you said Vivian you shouldn't dim your light and why would you want to work for a company that's flatly discriminating against you right in front of your face just imagine working for them that's going to be another uphill battle constantly constantly and you're putting yourself in a toxic work environment that you're going to eventually leave anyways so i would say it's an individual thing uh you got to look at the bigger picture here as well i think you say you know see ya i don't want to work for you anyways i rather work for a company that believes in equal opportunities for every single one and sees me as a human being and not the color of my skin or i don't look french I, I, and i agree with you guys i actually don't know what that means depending on how you are i when i face a situation that is blowing my mind i need to woosa for myself because otherwise i'm activating the other you know woman in me my historical woman in me and i don't want to show that in a professional setting so i sometimes need to woosa maybe you don't need to react in the heat of the moment react maybe the next day because then you had some time to think about it and express in a professional setting express what you shared if you want to share something melanie you're you're looking at me sideways like okay i'm eager to say something <laughs> no well it's the thing is it's something that's happened to me several times mm -hmm. as well as my friends of color in france it's it's a uh, an ongoing battle in france about what it means to be french or what it means to work at a french company because you have to understand the french brand you have to understand the french image and to them they don't want to present it as a person of color even though we know like the data in france they don't um calculate how many people of color work in a certain environment and stuff so it's very complicated but at the same time it's like in france i feel like nothing will be done and even if you decide that you want to go through with it as things stand right now i know from personal experience nothing will happen so you just have to think about your values what you want to do with your career and try to continue looking for that job that will hire you based on everything that you are collectively and it's something that's very tricky because you don't want to tell people you shouldn't fight for yourself and you shouldn't be your own advocate but at the same time you have to realize what are you trying to achieve with your career and how is the best way to go about doing that and you also have to be mindful of every time that you are you want to challenge a situation where you're dealing yep. with different isms it 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 can be draining yep. it can be very yeah. draining last year the end of last year there was a situation i'm not going to name the it company but i think that we all know what it's all about when somebody was fired because of the research that she had to share and um she was already saying that she was you know there was a communication about she being fired or she she leaving the company but at the end they admitted that she was fired that whole process in itself for her was mentally draining so be very be aware of what you're doing and what the actions you are taking and again also think about the bigger picture as well so liz yeah, I mean, I think my frame of mind is always, and maybe this is just my personality. I haven't dealt with it in the workplace, but I did deal with a housing situation where I had an HOA and my husband is white, he's Italian, which a lot of people are like, your husband's not Black Panther. Your husband isn't like, um, I don't know who wow. think my husband's Malcolm X or so, you know, reincarnated. No, my husband's white, he's Italian, and my children are biracial. And the HOA president came along and he saw my brother or somebody. He was like, oh, you guys don't even look like you guys could be related. My husband came back and told me that. And I was like, and then he had kind of like was making some comments and, you know, wanted to know who was coming in and out the house. And I'm the HOA president. Oh, you know what we're going to do? I'm going to go to housing and urban development. And I'm going to put in a complaint because I don't like that. Don't be coming around saying who and who is in here and you guys don't look like you're related. 
we're related doesn't mean that because we're not all the same same skin color doesn't mean that we're not related. So you know what we're gonna do since you want to be nosy and you want to be coming around and poking your nose in where it doesn't belong. I went right to HUD and I put in a complaint for racial discrimination and harassment and had HUD come investigate because you know and my husband was like oh it's going to cause so many problems we're probably going to end up moving well we're just going to have to move because i don't want to live here if i'm going to have someone poking their nose around and coming around and saying that all of us don't are we sure we all are in the same family and maybe they need to go to the landlord and, and figure out what's happening here because we don't look like we all belong in the same household that's discrimination because we don't have to look alike to be in the same family and now that you've poked your nose in I'm going to go ahead and have HUD investigate you and find out mm -hmm. why you're making racially discriminatory statements and causing a problem. So I think everyone, and, and it does become draining. It does become now HUD is investigating. Now it becomes the landlord is getting involved. Now it becomes this person now is going to make my life harder. So now I'm going to end up moving anyway. But you know what? That's fine because you got threatened with a lawsuit and I bet you don't do that again. And I'll just go yeah. move it or any other places in South Florida to live, but I bet you won't pull that prank again with anybody else. Yeah. So I think that you're right in that sometimes we don't necessarily want to fight the battle because now that didn't really help me. I, I still end up moving because my husband was like, well, he's being a problem now and I just don't feel, and I told him I don't feel comfortable living here now. But at the same time, now that landlord and that community and that person that's doing that, he got, kicked off the board. He wasn't HOA president anymore. And he won't be able to take his HOA presidency and cause problems for other people. So I think there are there is something to be said about, yeah, well, what is that going to do? People are not going to change. But John Lewis didn't say that. You know, yeah. um, Malcolm X didn't say that. Martin Luther King didn't say that. I feel as though sometimes as a social justice warrior, I get very depressed because I don't think that a lot of the things that I'm doing, I am not going to be the recipient of this because True, the world, I'm, seeds. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. just planting seeds for my son, yeah. for my grandkids, yeah. because I'm 40 yeah. something years old. So is the mm -hmm. world going to really change that much? My husband who, you know, he's, he's white Italian. He's like, you know what? Maybe it's just like the dinosaurs. Maybe we just have to wait until another 30 years before <laughs> You know, the, uh, these things materialize and people of color become the majority in America. And I'm like, oh my God, that's awful. That's depressing. He's like, well, the old people have to die off and we have to get a fresh, fresh blood. I mean, it's awful to think like this, but whatever, whatever our mind frame is, I think sometimes we can't think for today either. I'm not only thinking for myself when I'm fighting some mm -hmm. of these fights. I don't like getting trolled on social media. I don't like going and, and going to HUD and, and putting in a a, a, a a request for them to investigate this man. And then now the man that got kicked off the board of the HMA. But you know what? People need to tighten up. And that's the yeah. problem. If we keep letting them get away with stuff, then how are things ever going to change? And now things are not going to be better for my son or my grandkids. I'll just have to take an L for today if that means my kids and my grandkids will have a better life tomorrow. That's my, my personal philosophy. We are going a little bit over time. Do you mind if I'm going 10 minutes over time? I'm good. Yeah? Okay. Because I wanted to share um, the last two questions or at least, uh, yeah, I think, no, not I think, I know it is important to really share this question. <laughs> Um, how can leaders support people of color? What is your, your tip? And be a little bit summary, a little bit smaller with your tip. What can leaders do? When I start with Melanie, what, what is the one thing that you want leaders to know? I want leaders to expect their employees to bring their entire selves to work. It's like you mm -hmm. cannot hire people. Like we just spoke about the problem of the IT company. We cannot hire people and expect them to just be the face of the company because they look a certain way. But then when it comes to making decisions, they're disempowered in every single way possible. We have to make sure that the people that we're hiring, we're doing it not just to save face, but we're doing it because we want to see actual change happen at yeah. these different companies. You cannot hire a person of color and not expect them to bring their language, their culture, their religion and everything into the workplace. That's what makes them who they are. So you have to really sit down and think of yourself. You're not just hiring people to be 
somebody you can put on a billboard or you can put in a nice advertisement. You have to think of them also making the decisions in the boardroom and making a really great impact on what the company says that they're trying to achieve. Thank you. Gurpreet. I was going to say ask. Don't assume, but ask. Ask your t people who report into you how you can support them. I think a lot of times leaders are just making assumptions and assuming mm -hmm. that in their head that that's how it's got to be. But the only best way you can support anybody in your company, your team, is by asking what is that they need, how you can support them, and then be willing to take action on it. Don't just collect the information and then say, okay, well, I'm still going to do things my way. So ask and then implement. Thank you. Naomi? Yeah, for me, it goes in line. For me, it is pay attention and be curious, like really curious to see someone's um, authentic potential, someone's mm -hmm. authentic strength. For me, it would be that. Um, look past, you know, knowing what is similar to you, knowing what you like. Um, and it goes a little bit what what Gurpri said. Eh? Don't assume, but ask. Well, pay attention and be curious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Simone, I would say test the system. And I'm coming from you know my HR side of my brain, where we are great at creating policies, but our practices do not align with those policies. And mm. so take the time to ensure that the p equitable policies that you may have in your beautiful manual actually lines up in practice. People of color are not looking for any special favors and neither do they wanna be held back. We wanna be seen as a person first, not a color. And so we wanna make sure that on the ground, we are actually acting out and living out the policies of equity in our workplaces. Love that. Liz. Um, be a mentor. Be look Ooh. into how you can create mentorship opportunities and make sure that you're guiding the the people of color, black and brown people in your organization so that they have the opportunity to be leaders. We know here in the United States that there are 8% of C-suite employees that are black and that is woefully underrepresented in the C-suite. So what are we going to do you about have that? Some. You have some, you have some in the U S in Europe. Yes. <laughs> yes. And that's problematic <laughs> and that's problematic. And we, as black folk, we need mm -hmm. to be holding these organizations accountable yeah. because yeah. women, I've heard people say, well, we need to make, make the business case for why workplaces need to be diverse. Women don't do that. We don't go in and say, you know what we could do? We could be more nurturing and we, we don't give you a business case of, of, of some stereotypical idea of what a woman brings into the workplace. We're just like, women are 50% of the population. We need to be in these spaces. We don't create these business cases in our head. We're just like, women are in the population. We're part of the demographic. We are going to be in corporate America, right? So I think the same thing goes for black folk. We need to be in these spaces and we need to hold leadership accountable. What are they doing to groom? When leaders like Wells Fargo president comes out and says, well, we can't find qualified black folk to be leaders in our organization and we can't find you know, Google or any other Facebook. Sponsor them. If you can find them, sponsor them. Sponsor and them. that's what they need to be doing. They need to be making sure that they're intentional. And we have to hold organizations accountable because they're we're spending our dollars with these companies, but not holding them accountable for some of these um, measurements and, and me meaningful ways of changing diversity within the organization. I, I totally love it. And also the last thing that I wanted to add is educate yourself to become an inclusive leader. So instead of asking your people what they need also, of course you need to ask that, but also educate yourself to become an inclusive leader. So stop with the traditional leadership, inclusive leadership, that is what is, is equitable. That is what's bankable. That is what companies need right now for them to be thriving. That's the last thing that I want to share. And I also wanted to ask, uh, we are now in 2021, right? 
And I have a question. 2025, will we still be having this conversation or? Sadly. Probably. <laughs> most, most probably. Yeah. It's, it's four years. Is there a light yeah. of hope in having this pandemic or being locked down in this pandemic and what occurred last year? Do you see hope? Is it hopeful for you, Naomi? Um, yeah, I think I'm going to be positive and hopeful and, you know, all mm -hmm. cheery now. Um, so I hope that it's sort of accelerated because we had the pandemic. So we sort of had to move quicker than we would, you know, otherwise would have done. So my wish for 2025, it's four years, Vivian, it is nothing. I know, I but, know. <laughs> I know. But, I just but a lot has happened in one year. A lot has happened yeah. in one year. So which yeah. felt like 100 years last year, but okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what I hope is that, that what I hope, what I really wish for is that bringing your authentic self to the work mm -hmm. is not considered brave anymore, but it's normal. It's mm. normalized. That would be my wish for 20 Exactly, exactly. I will be in. Liz. Yeah, I mean, I try to be very hopeful in that I, I really think that if nothing else, this has brought a normalization in terms of these types of conversations. There was a, last year this time, Black folk are kind of like whispering, you know, just like, don't let them hear you, you know? We're all kind of congregated in the pews, complaining, but nobody ever wanted to say anything because it's like, if you say that, like, you're, what are you trying to do? You're trying to start a riot in here. You're trying to, you know, do some Black Lives Matter protests. Like, you weren't allowed to say there's inequity. You weren't allowed to yeah. say, hey, you work twice as hard as, as somebody else. You weren't allowed to talk about pay inequity or the fact that there's not enough Black leadership within organizations because it was looked at like what are you trying to do like that's something that we kind of keep amongst ourselves we don't say that so the fact that the conversations are happening i think it's a step in the right direction will we hold organizations accountable will we see meaningful and measurable change that's what i want to see yeah. and that remains to be seen that's that's i think yeah. performative anybody can put a, a, a little fist up there on instagram and a black box and a statement or we support uh, Black Lives Matter and, and equity, that's great. But what does your C-suite look Let's look at your website and what's going on <laughs> with that pay with about our leadership. Diverse. So if you're just gonna do a black box, you're not gonna make any changes. I think you're kind of wasting our time here. So we need to make sure that we follow up and take a look Where at is Oprah. Oprah, please talk to Liz. <laughs> <laughs> Get her on, on the couch ice. right away. <laughs> right away on the couch. <laughs> Thank you, and thank I, you, Liz. I would say shrug emoji, mommy. Shrug emoji. <laughs> <laughs> Gurpreet, what, Gurpreet, what is your wish? I say, uh, I, I'm going to agree with everybody else, like hopeful, because uh, 2020 has shown us a lot of things, right? With the pandemic, Black Lives Matters, people are willing to stand up now. People are willing yeah. to voice. And that I think that alone has been a big shift in 2020 where I agree with Liz before it's like you know you're whispering and stuff sometimes I've been the only color person sometimes I've been the only woman in the management team right mm -hmm. um and now we're we have that courage because we have platforms to raise our voices and I agree <laughs> with Liz and Ian's, uh in the sense that you know don't just say Black Lives Matters. And I got annoyed with that too, or companies just hiring people for the sake of showing face, but make a real change in your organization. Mm -hmm. Real changes are needed. It's not let me just go hire any black person or any color person and say, oh, look, we're diversified. Because right. I laugh at those companies. I've been laughing at those companies for years and I've been laughing this entire year more because you're sitting there, you're realizing you're just doing it for to to show a face, right? To save your faces. But the real problem is in the organizations. And when people are starting to wake up now, more people are willing to not to put up with people's, part of my language, BS. And that is with companies, right? You have to stand up for what you believe in. And I agree with Liz in that uh, earlier point that if you're not willing to stand up, well, then no one's gonna ever stand up and then there's never gonna be change. So it takes one person 
to lead the change, just one person. So just remember, anybody that's, everybody that's listening to this, it takes just one person to make the change and it starts with us. Thank you, thank you. Yes, indeed, no more tokenism. No more tokenism, <laughs> no absolutely. More tokenism. Mm -hmm. Simone. I wanna piggyback off everything that everyone has said and just to say, we need to fan the flames of change. Mm. So it mm. it wasn't what it was a hundred years ago, sixty years ago, forty years ago. It's not where we want it to be, yeah. but it is an investment. It may not be yeah. an investment in our futures specifically, and I think that we have seen inroads. We're living better lives because of what other people have done before yeah. us. And so, even though it may seem daunting and discouraging, we cannot give up. And whatever we can do in our circles of influence to fan the flames of change. So if that's us as HR professionals standing up for what's right, checking the policies, making sure that we are offering the diversity and inclusion training, that we are holding people's feet to the fire, whatever that is and wherever we are, whether that is mm -hmm. in an apartment complex, whether that is at a school, where, if that's at a church, wherever we are, that we stand up for the cause and we make sure that even if it is 30, 40, like uh, Liz's husband says, 30, 40 years from now, 100 years from now, that somebody's life is going to be better because yeah. we did something. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Melanie. Well, well, um, for me, it's like I'm thinking of it in a French context and mm -hmm. Europe at large is that I really hope that there will be more data collection when it comes to hiring of people of color as well as people's backgrounds because that information re really leads to a lack of understanding of what's going yeah. on in the work environment in France and Europe. And hopefully that will also push execs and businesses to want to have better mentorship and reverse mentorship and sponsorship programs because that's something we're really lacking in France because again the data isn't there so I think the yeah. only way we can actually see some form of change or humanize in the workplace is to get that information out there which and it doesn't exist thus far so yeah I would say if somebody's watching from the Euro European Union Please legislate this because we need the data, the data to to make change happen, change happen, but also make it visible. Because in some countries here in Europe, we are not allowed to track, and there are reasons. I understand the reasons why they don't want to track, but then again, we need something to amplify that and to create transparency in uh, making the workplace more inclusive and more better. So I. Again, ladies, wow, my ears, it's buzzing, right? I could have done a talk for hours, but let's say next 2022. I know it's next year, but we need to we need to have this conversation again to see what happened within the year so that we have a yearly thing going on because I feel like this topic is totally relevant and for the people that you know missed out on this conversation know that you can always listen back on on uh the various pod, uh, podcast stations so i'll definitely share it here i had an amazing time and also i want to say thank you for the audience you were on fire i had a challenging time to keep track on all the com all the all the messages but thank you thank you for being here thank you for sharing the love and thank you for challenging us but because without you i could never have done this and without the panel we could never have done this so thank you for for uh lifting you know this topic off up i was in doubt of doing it but now i know that i should never doubt this i always <laughs> live for people of color and especially if i can help one person um, inspire one person to do better and do better in a mental way because know that sometimes dealing with these challenges in the workplace it can drain you in a huge way and i want to i want you to to uh distance yourself from that and move above that there is always a better place that knows your value and knows how to value you as a person and as a creative person that you are so thank you totally. uh especially yeah, from yeah thank you the, the love goes internationally, so thank you. Um, I also wanted to share some comments because the comments are 
booming here. I couldn't have done it without you, ladies. So thank you again. And thank you for the audience. Wow. It was amazing. So please stay live, ladies. I'm going to uh, close out and I'm going to say thank you. Next week, yeah. I will be having a conversation about intersectionality oh, wow. with a diversity <laughs> and eye panel. Yes, we are going to bring in the heat. So yeah. watch for next week, same time, same place. And I wish you a good day. Bye.